Hey everyone, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, and thanks for for coming out on a on a busy busy Wednesday evening. I'm sure you have a million better things to do too than listening to an aspiring entrepreneur. Uh, so I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, my journey and, and TransferWise and uh, happy to take any questions uh, any questions you have and feel free to shout out uh, during the talk uh, as well and then we can happy to happy to dig into this. Uh, but I start with something so we're we're very uh, one of the reasons for setting up TransferWise was transparency or to be exact uh, lack of transparency in banking and financial services. Uh, and so we've got a little campaign called Nothing to Hide and I will start with a video which was filmed last week in New York. So last week we launched TransferWise in the US and we, we celebrated that by having a little uh, little transparent uh, transparent march in New York. It was lots of fun, but also also pretty cold. Um, I will, uh, but I have to say it was uh, the best uh, best ever working day I've had. I never thought that I would do something like this in my in my professional life and spend uh, half a day running around in my underwear in New York. Uh, I'll just uh, say a few words about. Uh, where I'm coming from, so I'll uh, I'll start with as many of you here are uh, are business school students. I actually I dropped out from my undergraduate degree in Tallinn. I was studying uh, computer science, but I when we were getting Skype started, it was a bit more exciting to go to work, and I dropped out from there. But uh, but I did go to business school. I went I went to the only business school in Europe, which is one year. So LBS is is also a great business school for two years, but for one year there was no no choice here. But uh, early on, um, after so I'm from Estonia, which I'll touch upon later as well. But uh, pretty early on, I met the guys in Estonia who, who later on ended up building Skype, so Niklas and Janos, uh, and uh, they had already built something called Kaza and caused lots of lots of trouble in the, in the music industry. And then I kind of realized that the these guys are definitely far from being done, and there is more more coming more coming from them. So I ended up working with them and then becoming the, the first employee of Skype, which was uh, seven years of, uh, of a crazy, crazy ride, literally starting with uh, the idea for Skype being on the, on the back of a napkin, and from there on building the company to the first few hundred million, few hundred million users, and then being there at when the company was sold to eBay and, and later on. So amazing experience, and that was probably my... Uh, that was my real life MBA, and, and after that, I went went to INSEAD for a year and and got the academic side of it as well. Um, over the time, I've uh, become an angel investor, so probably invested in 20, 25 companies. Some of them have been sold, TweetDeck, Mendeley, OMG Pop. So, but I, I consider consider that to be more of a more of a hobby. And I uh, usually when I make an angel investment, it's because I find something else which is so exciting that I'd like to like to be a part of it and help them. And, uh, and end up becoming an, an investor and helping the company. But then for the past the past five years, I've been very busy building TransferWise. So TransferWise is an online online platform for doing my transfer. And you know, to be honest, my transfer is incredibly incredibly boring. But we've been able to do it in a in a way which is a bit more a bit more exciting and and we can definitely see it in in the way we've been able to to grow to grow the business. But I'll just start with a very kind of very beginning. Okay? So the business is really built because of personal frustration. So as mentioned, I'm from Estonia, and and at some point during my during my Skype journey, I moved from Estonia to London, 
but I was still staying on the payroll for Skype in Estonia, so every month I had to go to the bank and literally had to walk to the bank branch because online banking wasn't uh, wasn't quite there yet. And then, you know, you go to the bank branch, you stand in line and you say, hey, you know, here's my thousand euros I want to transfer to London. And the bank clerk tells you, sure, we'll do it for you, you know, it's only going to cost you 20 euros, euros or so. You do that and send them, you wait three, four, five days and the money arrives and you go looking and you see that what you arrive with much less than you think you should be getting. So I go look on the, on Reuters for the interbank exchange rate and it tells me that for the thousand euros I should get 800 pounds but I end up getting 770 or 80 or 60 so kind of kind of frustrating. At this time I met Christo who is now my co-founder at TransferWise. He's another Estonian guy. He was uh, already living in London getting paid in London, but he had to send some money back to Estonia. So every month he went through the same process. He went to Lloyd's, stood in line, you know, even even much of a, uh, even worse of an experience because the banking in UK is really, really poor. And uh, stood in line and sent some money to Estonia and had the very same, very same result. You know, what you get isn't, isn't, quite, uh, isn't quite what you're expecting to get. And that left, left both of us uh, pretty, pretty desperate and frustrated. No, maybe you know, it's, a good, it's a good detour now to talk a little bit about banking in general and what's, what's happened in banking. So I was quite surprised, uh, I think two years ago, um, I opened up an account with Barclays. And uh, in Estonia, to open up a bank account is, is a very straightforward process. I walk in the bank branch and I come out from there with an account maybe 10 minutes later. I know still a little bit of paperwork, but, uh, but now that I... Uh, know quite a lot about banking regulation that feels uh, a fairly efficient way of doing it. However, in London and in lots of, uh, let's say, old Europe, it is far from that easy. So when I wanted to open a bank account, I went into Barclays and I said, hey guys, I'm here to open a bank account. And so the first reply was uh, pretty weird. It was, uh, you know, you have to book an appointment to open an account. Okay, so I book an appointment and they tell me to come back tomorrow at 12. So I, I, I come back tomorrow at 12 and send, you know, in the little lovely booth that, say, I was, that I was assigned to, there's no one there. So I go in back in the regular queue, stand in the queue for 10 minutes and tell them, hey, what's the fuck? And they tell me, that if, uh, sorry, uh, everybody is sick, we couldn't even call you to tell you your appointment has been cancelled. Uh, at that point I was fairly upset, so... Uh, uh, they sent someone from another branch there to open an account for me. That took uh, an amount of time. And then I was sitting there for probably a better part of an hour to do the paperwork for opening an account. The paperwork itself isn't that complicated, but somehow it still managed to take an hour because their computer systems are so slow and, and whatnot. So, you know, in the end result, well, I spent quite a few hours doing that. Uh, and, and I got my account open, but that wasn't quite the end of it. A couple of months later, I was traveling somewhere, and my phone rings, and uh, it's Barclays, and there's a, a lady who is incredibly upset, and tells me that uh, she's very, very sorry, but they have lost my paperwork, and unless I go to the bank right away, they will close my account again. So I think this kind of, this uh, sums up the state of, of banking uh, in uh, in the UK and in in much of much of the developed world. You know, meanwhile, life has been moving on in other, in other industries. So to listen to music, we're going to go now to Spotify or RDO. And you know, instead, of, instead of paying $10 to buy a piece of plastic, we pay $10 a month and we get access to all the music we want. Uh, if you look at telecommunications, and uh, instead of uh, calling up the operator and saying, I want to make a long-distance call to America, we, we go into Skype or now many other, many other tools and we can speak for free High definition video calling. Uh, you know, when we look at media, the media sector has changed because of the internet and and so on. But for uh, example, banking has and financial services are one of the sectors that has escaped this change. But at the same time, consumers want their banks to be like Skype, like Spotify, like Uber. You know, what's what's happened in those sectors is, uh, is a couple of things. Everything has become much uh, much faster. So we don't. We really don't like standing in line waiting for things to happen. We want things to be instantaneous. We want them to be to be fast. 
Um, second thing, everything has become much cheaper, and not 10% cheaper, but rather an order of magnitude cheaper. So Skype made phone calls free, so where you listen to music on Spotify is much cheaper, you know, print subscriptions, everything. Everything has changed, you know, different business models and a little bit of cutting out the unnecessary, mi unnecessary middlemen. And the third one is uh, everything is, uh, is more transparent. You know what you're paying for. You go to comparison sites to compare and so on. And the overall user experience is, is much better. And now consumers are also going to banks saying we want the same thing. We want things to be more transparent, we want them to be faster, we want them to be cheaper. But banks aren't quite, quite delivering. Okay? And the result of that is what we can see now is that uh, one vertical after another, so traditional banking is being uh, broken down and being delivered much better by startups. Eh? So lending, sorry, a lot of peer-to-peer -peer lending happening, possibly the biggest uh, fintech sector, but also other forms of lending, whether you know, for, the, uh, for taking off the overdraft part of banking, so whether it's Wonga or other, other similar lending things. And money transfer, we're taking that away from banks. It's an asset management, Wealthfront, Nutmeg, and uh, a number of other robo-advisors and similar services. You know, similarly, insurance is being disrupted and so on. So vertical after vertical, it's, uh, it's tech companies who are going after what, what used to be banking services and stripping these away from banks. So one can only wonder what's going what's gonna to be left of banking in five or five or ten years, ten years to come. And I can offer my own version of it later. Uh, but so banking is broken and then the frustration that we had from our own, from our own experience led us, to, led us to a revelation. So we realized that I was sending money from Estonia over to London, and Christo was sending money from London over to Estonia. So actually the money is there already. There's no need for us to go to a bank to make an expensive and complicated international transfer. So we thought that we can do it in a, in a different way. So what we did next month is that I transferred money from my account in Estonia to Christo's account in Estonia, and he transferred money from his account in London to my account in London. And we looked at the interbank exchange rate and used that. Boom. It worked. It was quick and we saved a bunch of money. So we set up a, a Skype chat with a, with a couple of friends where literally we would say, hey, I need 1,000 pounds, I need euros. It was working, uh, working well. And that got us thinking. And we started thinking about uh, it's something which is working well in a close group of friends. And there are so many other people in the world who need the very same thing. Maybe we can do something to help them. So, and, and from, from there, we, we kind of started thinking about, so, how do we go uh, uh, building this into a service? We, uh, we also write some numbers. We realize that uh, there are 200 million people who either work, live, or study abroad. So, these are all people who would, who would benefit from this. They're all people who don't have this trusted friend abroad. Uh, and we saw that uh, they would probably all like to use something, something like that. We went about it... Uh, uh, so we, we went about it in a very, very entrepreneurial way and, and built a site and, and launched a service, which has uh, gotten us to, to kind of where we are, where we are now, realizing that we're in the business of building, building better, better financial services. We started with, with, a very, with a very small service. We started by letting people transfer money from Estonia to London. And then again, back from London to Estonia. So, kind of very, sorry, uh, very, uh, very limited and uh, and very, very simple to use. But then we've been we've been building uh, building things on top of that. Now, I think you know, reflecting on a couple couple things which uh, which I think are have been important in the journey. And I think the first one of these is to to start small. So the way we launched Sensorwise was. Uh, literally focusing on the very smallest thing we can do, which is transferring money between euros and pounds. And, uh, and we did that in a very, uh, in a very I would say, uh, ugly way. So you can see this is the first, first website we had. So we, the code word for the project was common effects, so common people's foreign exchange. But that's uh, pretty close to, the, to what we had when we, when we launched it. But it was, it was enough to to get a feel from people that it's something which, which they believe works. When we launched, you know, we built the site, we got the first license from the, from the regulator, and then we were kind of, you know, struggling. What do we do, what do, we do next? 
But, you know, we want to scream to the whole world that this great thing exists now. But how do we do it? So we uh, had a friend put us in touch with a, with a journalist who works for TechCrunch, uh, the tech blog, and then he wrote an article about this, uh, calling it uh, the Skype of money transfer. And that, uh, that article was kind of the, the beginning, uh, beginning of the journey. Fifteen minutes after that article was published, the first guy made the, made a transaction and sent two thousand pounds. For us, it was a moment of shit. What are we going to do now? <laughs> we weren't weren't quite uh, quite ready or or expecting that. But it was also it was a it was a fantastic signal that what we're doing uh, and at least one person who likes it. So there might be more. So that's when we got started and uh, and starting uh, building from this. Uh, not so appealing or or trust building site into something something bigger. Among other things, what we learned is that FX is not a word that consumers know or use. You know, we re- we, we realize quickly that what we're doing is we're really in the business of money transfer and and that uh, our enemy or well, I wouldn't say enemy, but uh, the, the alternative to using us is is banks. So most of our customers come from come from having having used a bank and. Uh, they really don't care about FX, but they want to get their money from A to B in a, in a very easy way. Uh, the second lesson is about choosing a big big market. So I think already in, in Skype, by, Skype taught me this lesson for the first time, that if you want to, if you want to build something which has an, has an impact on the world, then you got to think about big, big market, you know. I'm sure lots of you have used the word time total addressable market, which uh, I think probably before Skype didn't really, I didn't quite register it. You know, you can have a large market. You can I think about all the million people that live in Estonia. Sorry, it's more, it's 1.3 million. You know, that could seem like a, like a large market. But, but if you really, if you want to have an, if you want to, if you want to have an impact in the world and, and make it a little bit better, you got to choose a bigger, a bigger target market. So, with Skype and telecommunication, it was fairly simple. Telecom is, is pretty big, and now with TransferWise, also, you know, having a, a market which is big ahead of us has been, I think, really key to what we've done so far, and even more important in the next uh, next five, five or ten years of what we're building. We did start the, off very small with a with a very limited market trans- transactions up to two thousand pounds between UK and uh, and euros but then we've been uh, we've been very busy increasing that and we kind of realized that our our target market is uh, is growing growing together with together with us and uh, and making the whole thing uh, much more much more exciting for us what we realized by now is that uh, we're probably capped by a target market of 5 to 10 trillion dollars of money which moves around country borders every year <coughs> So that's money which either individuals or small to medium businesses send across country borders. You know, we've excluded uh, all the all the big and boring stuff like governments and uh, and multinational corporations. But five or ten trillion is is what's 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 within our reach. And then from there, thinking about uh, can we get to a few percent of it becomes uh, becomes very exciting okay? because that's uh, that's uh, that's a very big amount of money which uh, which needs to be moved. And and if we believe we can do it in a better way, then I think we can get to we can get to addressing uh, addressing all of that. Um, so walking through maybe a few a few things from the from the road road here. So when we launched the business, it was me and Krista. We were uh, it was basically the two of us uh, working uh, out of uh, Krista's kitchen in London, and we were we were both part time. So at the time we launched, Krista actually was. Uh, was still he was working for Deloitte and uh, you know he had to he had to hide into a meeting room to see customer support calls uh, <laughs> and uh, I was actually running another startup in and then it was uh, it was awkward to explain why am I launching something else in parallel but uh, but I think the important thing is that we that we got going with it and we and we launched it because I think that's where most people get stuck they get stuck about thinking that we could do this or we should do this uh, versus getting uh, getting started. Uh, by end of the first year, I think, you know, being, being totally honest, we had gotten a, a clue of what we're doing, and we had built a team of uh, a total of, uh, total of five people. But with that, we were able to also attract our, our first financing, and uh, we had uh, Max Levchin, who was the founder of uh, PayPal and uh, IA Ventures, 
and in the expenditures we uh, put together a seed round of 1.3 million dollars. And then I think it was a kind of after that, and we really started understanding of uh, getting a feeling for how do we how do we grow how do we grow the business from there into into something which operates on on multiple multiple countries and uh, and grows uh, grows from there. So I can't remember how many people we were end of two thousand twelve, but maybe I'll. Uh, go back to the last year. So beginning of last year, we were a team of 50 people and uh, we had expanded uh, the company from sending money between euros and pounds uh, in, uh, in small amounts to, to sending money from uh, Europe, so uh, all of UK and, uh, and mainland Europe uh, into about 20, 20 other currencies. And uh, we had also probably figured out uh, how do we how to focus on on growing the business? How do we do how do we do marketing for a for a disruptive financial service in a in a reasonable way? And I will kind of realize that we need to, given that my transfer itself is boring, we need to do something extra to draw attention to it, which has inspired us in our in our marketing marketing efforts. We've never been shy of making fun of others or, or ourselves in, in things we do. Uh, from beginning of, of last year to now, we've also gone through a pretty pretty massive uh, growth in headcount. So we're 280 people now. So it starts uh, looking like a, like a real company. And lastly, we uh, end of end of last year we uh, we raised another round of financing, uh, being the first European company to raise money from Andreessen Horowitz uh, and raise 58 uh, million from them. Uh, but what I think is, is more, even more exciting for me is really the journey of how do we, how do we go from here? So we have a great little business, 280 people uh, earning, uh, earning decent revenues and, and moving pretty decent amounts of customers' money. So to date now we have, uh, we have uh, transferred more than three billion pounds of our customers' money, and uh, this means we've, we've put back. Uh, about 150 million pounds of bank fees into customers' pockets. So if you translate that 150 million pounds of bank fees into bankers' bonuses, which hasn't been paid out, that's a that's a big number of Porsches or or whatever else they would be buying with that. But even even with that, what we've uh, what we've achieved so far is probably one percent of the of UK market share, and uh, and zero percent worldwide. So now we're uh, we're busy going from uh, from a European operation into a, into a global company. So we, as you could see, we launched in the US uh, last week. We'll be launching in Australia in the next month or so, and then going from there into into a, a number of other other countries. And we've set ourselves a, a fairly fairly big goal of uh, from one percent UK market share and zero percent zero percent global market share. We really want to grow this to maybe 10% market share in the UK and maybe 5% in the other key countries. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, that is still quite, uh, it, is quite, it is amazing for a simple reason that even though we've been in business for a while, uh, there is still actually so much, uh, so much no, so much no brainer growth ahead of us. Uh, and most of that for a simple reason that we've been able to choose, uh, choose a very, very large, uh, very large target market, uh, somewhere where we know that uh, it's a need from customer side uh, to use a fair banking service, uh, something that, that, that operates in a, in a cheap and, and fast way is, uh, is, is big and that need is, is not going, uh, going away anywhere. So, you know, I've, I've left this empty here and I'm hoping to, hoping to come back in five years from now and, uh, and having, having filled out all of these empty, empty boxes here to, to tell the story of the, of the next chapter. But I think uh, probably the more fun thing will be now to, to start diving into into questions and uh, and uh, I'll expand any any other uh, any other parts of what we what we've done and how. Sure, is that up, sir? Just kind of when you were raising the first capital from uh, Max and Intex at that seed stage, were you did you already make the transition to working full time on Transferwise and did your co-founder get out of Deloitte already or? How did you make that transition from part time to being fully focused on? So when uh, when we launched, we were both part time, but then 
we got uh, a lot of confidence from the first transactions uh, and started moving towards uh, towards focusing on this very very quickly from there. Uh, I think uh, you know, the, the point of when you raise uh, external financing is probably the point of no return. You know, until until that you can be you can be playing playing with the business and uh, you know you can decide to to shut it down or or go skiing or, or do whatever you want. But uh, but the point where you go out to to raise money from investors is uh, the point where you need to start taking this uh, taking this professionally. You know, and some people get that confused and that doesn't usually end very very well for them. So maybe fir first thing about business model is uh, how do how do we make money, which I uh, conveniently didn't tell you. Um, so what we what we do so when when we're thinking about pricing, we were we had quite some struggles at first to figure out what is the right way to charge for it. How how much do we charge? Uh, you know, probably we were even even before launching tempted about okay, so everyone does this business by having a markup on the rates. Uh, but we, we, we realize that this transparency is something which is which is very core to this. The unfairness we felt when using the banking service is largely due to the fact that they, they are very good at hiding their fees into various different components. So the exchange rate markups the banks have and then the transaction fee. So we decided that we're going to be always using the mid-market exchange rate to, to make the currency conversion and, and made that kind of a very core thesis of what we do. And then we very clearly quote you the fee we charge. So we charge, in the UK, we charge 0.5%, which is typically about 10 times less than, than what, a, what a bank charges. And we deliberately chose a very low price point to make sure that nobody can, nobody can attack us on price. So you know, I kind of imagine as a way banks chose their pricing was very much like, how much can we charge and get away with it? But it was very like, kind of maximize how much you can charge. And, you know, it's not a, not a stupid strategy, exactly. But, and then, you know, in the UK, there are also lots of other things called foreign exchange brokers, which then kind of figure how much do we charge. Let's charge less than a bank, but still as much as we can get away with. But we went the diagonally opposite way of how little can we charge to build a global sustainable business. So that's how we came up with our pricing, and we don't think anybody can, can undercut us by 10x anymore. And then, you know, leading on to your question about how do we manage the money flows. Uh, so when we launched the business, we had a, a tough choice to make, which was uh, what if people want to send money from London to Estonia, but nobody wants to send money from Estonia to London? Then you, you have two, two ways of dealing with it. Number one is you tell people to wait, possibly indefinitely. And that's probably a, a very painful way of killing your business or never getting started. Too. But the other way, is you figure it out. So we, we went the hard way of figuring it out. And it was the first transactions when we had an imbalance. I actually went to my bank in Estonia and exchanged that money in my bank. We lost money on every transaction, but it was fine because we, we were able to make these customers, uh, customers happy and we were able to provide them with the service. So uh, in large currency pairs like pound and euro, we have uh, very, very good liquidity. But by kind of by its nature, it never balances out perfectly. So when it doesn't balance out, then we go to the market. We buy currency on the market. You know, by now because of the volumes we're doing, we're able to do it at, at fairly fairly good rates on the on the interbank market. But the other side of it is you know managing all of that, managing the liquidity is, is a fairly decent operation. And the best way I found to to think about this is actually it's a logistics operation. We have to make sure that we have the right amount of money in the right currency on the right bank account. And, and we have to do that with having the least amount of our own money in play. Of course, we need some liquidity buffers. That's the nature of the business. But, but trying to keep them smaller makes the business much more efficient. Uh, today, you are your competition in our banks. And then you, you buy them with a 10 times lower rate. But I guess like tomorrow your competition will be the other transfer ones, or the other likes. Um, how do you how do you plan uh, to to defend your, your your position and 
what do you think would be your competitive advantage in, in five years or ten years? So can I just can I ask you to expand on uh, on why why tomorrow I'm going to be competing with uh, with others? Because it, I assume that the uh, the market entry is is, is the, in, the barrier to uh, to entering the, uh, the industry is probably not so high. Classic uh, classic thing taught in this house, I'm sure. <laughs> I, w I, w I would have thought the same way myself, probably. Um, I mean, you're, you're partially, tr partially right that uh, you can look at it as a barrier is not being so high. Um, so the reality of it is a little bit more complicated. So the barriers are regulatory. So you have to, you have to get regulatory coverage, which you know, is obviously doable and probably the, the bigger and more funded device easier it is to do. Um, second thing is you need to build the systems and the operation. So we've been doing it for four years with 280 people, and we're far from being done. Um, third, probably most important, is building trust. Why should anyone trust you with their money? I wouldn't trust you with my money. I don't know. I don't know why the first guy trusted us with their money. Honestly, I have no idea. Uh, but you know, I'm glad they did. So, trust is probably the hardest one to to fabricate. You know, we've been we've been working on building trust and building our brand and building awareness for four years, and we'll continue doing this, doing this forever. Um, but the more, probably another very key point here is uh, make sure you keep on pushing your product forward as fast as possible. So, yes, we're not the only, only people helping other people move money. There are other startups doing this uh, in UK and the rest of the world. Uh, but I feel, uh, I feel pretty good about where we are because I know that our pace of growth and our pace of development is faster than theirs. And even they might be younger companies, smaller teams, for some reason we're able to, uh, I don't want to say innovate faster, we're able to build our product faster. And our, our iteration cycles to keep on building the product and to keep on building, bringing it to new markets are only getting faster at this point. You know, we've kind of, the thing we've thought about since the beginning is speed is incredibly important. Speed of transfer for customers is important, but the speed of your development, the speed of your learning. So we've, uh, we've designed this organization in a way that we have very small independent teams uh, and can iterate as fast as possible. So because of this, I'm pretty confident that uh, there isn't any <coughs> current competitor or future competitor that is able to, to surpass us uh, in, in kind of traditional and conventional circumstances. Can I just build on what you say? Please do. Um, it's a live case study. Yeah, no. Thanks for your thanks for your answer. And I was actually uh, thinking about uh, Uber. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm not in the industry, but I'm, I'm the press, and, and I was I was I had the um, the speed in mind when 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 and the size and, and, and the, the time that you need to get to a sustainable size uh, in your business. Do you have any, any any number in mind of market share or, or countries that you think you should get before? You can start breathing, and, and before you can be sure that you've you've you've, you've got a, a comfortable position on the in the industry. Probably the moment you get to that comfortable position is when somebody <laughs> goes past you. So I you know I do think that it's uh, you know business is is competitive, and the moment you you stop thinking about that is probably the beginning beginning of your end. And you know it might be might be a super long cycle from there. You know if you look at if you look at banks, you know banks will have a very good business for a long time to come, but uh, but they will they'll be losing market share slowly to slowly to others. Uh, I don't have a, a good number in mind to say like when when are we done, when are we there. Um, I do think that uh, as long as long as we can see that we can keep on investing in growing the business, uh, we're going to keep on doing that. We're going to keep on doing that fairly aggressively. Also, you know, other thing to keep in mind is probably overall market conditions. I do no. I'm sure three years from now something is going to be different in the market environment around us, which might dictate different choices. But for now, it's about uh, keeping on investing to to grow the business and, and doing that as fast as we can. Can I ask about market? Are you at the centre taking the credit risk when you're performing? We have set our model up in a way that we don't take any risk. 
because the moment we the moment we we have a customer, we match it with another customer, so we don't take any any currency risks. Yeah? Uh, what do you mean by if they don't perform? If the guy is meant to send his euros to Lithuania and decides not to, and the other man well, we, 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 we guarantee the rates the moment we have received their money. And you'll match the other Well, we'll make sure that, uh, that we're covered on both sides, uh, or we go to the interbank market. Uh. Over there. Thank you for the speech. Uh, my question is around uh, regulation. So when you entered into this market, what sort of uh, banking regulations or challenges you had to face? For example, anybody put money longer using this mechanism and say I want to transfer millions of euros to some other country. So uh, we are in a regulated sector. In the UK we have a license from the, from the FCA an authorized feminine institu institution license in every country where we take money from customers we have uh, a similar license <coughs> going through the license, licensing process is a, is a slightly painful uh, experience but as you can see I've survived um, KYC and anti-money laundering so know, know your customer in, in banking speak is, uh, is an integral part of the business so we perform similar level of checks as the commercial banks do when it comes to preventing anti-money Preventing money laundering and uh, and knowing where the money comes from, where it goes from, you know, we've we've, we've spent lots of uh, lots of time developing our process and technology to make that uh, as uh, as user friendly as as possible. But that's that's a that's a very important part of it, and uh, and failing that would would have pretty pretty bad consequences. Let's go over on this side. <coughs> Thanks for the speech. You mentioned that trust was a key element of your model, and I wanted to know how hard it was to get the people to live up to those concepts. So I'm, uh, I know for a fact that today, every day there are many thousands, tens of thousands of people who come to the site and who think it's a service I could need, but why the hell should I trust them? So I think trust is going to be an issue for any financial service for the rest of time to come. Banks have a trust issue similarly. You know, unfortunately, everybody kind of has to use a bank, so you don't trust the banks, but you, you trust your bank a tiny bit more. Um, so, you know, we went about building trust using media media recommendations. Uh, you know, we I do lots of uh, lots of media engagement. I probably have one press interview a day. I've been doing it for four past four years. Uh, using using these tools and then other outside credibility, whether it's investors and so on, to to help people people trust us. But probably the most important of all is uh, trust you get from your from your friends. So a lot of our growth is coming from word of mouth, which goes from customer to customer, and uh, and looking at uh, looking at your customers as your ambassadors. Uh, I think it's also incredibly important, and, and getting them to recommend TransferWise and to and to talk about it, and to make it easy for someone who wants to use us to see if if there are any friends they can they can refer to. And you talked a bit about your competition um, protection going into the future, but what did you do on the early stages when you were sort of small player in the market, and then when did you decide to ramp up and start a big marketing campaign? You asked about competition at yeah. first, and then when did we decide to ramp up? So initially, there was no competition. I mean, the competition initially was banks, Western Union, PayPal. So you know, I wouldn't recommend to go into a field if there are already five people doing what you're doing. So you know, I think you know, if you go if you go in in such a place already, then I think you got, you got to have you got to believe in something which these people don't believe on. You got, you got to have some kind of advantage. So. I do assume that you start off having uh, having a product advantage or some something which is significantly better, which uh, doesn't effectively make it uh, no competition. So, when you decide to start ramping up, you need to learn a fair amount about how your business operates, what are the levers to grow it. You need to know a little bit about your customer economics, 
to be able to think about how much money you can afford to spend on marketing. Okay? So I think all of these things, uh, all of these things take time. Eh? So we we started <coughs> outdoor marketing probably a year and a half ago. So kind of 2013 summer summer fall. That's when we had our first uh, posters out in the, out in the UK. So. And from Saran, we've, we've been trying different things. You know, we've tried TV, which uh, has been much less successful than outdoor outdoor posters. You know, we do we do lots of this. Uh, let's call it experimental marketing. You know, and we found we found ways to to use this to amplify amplify word of mouth. You know, we're actually seeing that these things are are paying back in a in a pretty pretty quick time frame. But I think you know, if you're growing your business. Uh, 10x uh, at a time, and your marketing is constantly changing as well because channels which which would work earlier don't work anymore. Your audience is changing, so that's a, a constant uh, constant learning experiment. How do we how do we keep on driving growth? And, and also, different markets would behave as different, and different maturity levels in the market means different. So, you know, we. So the way we're entering the US is a little bit different, and, and we'll see we'll see how well uh, how well that's going to work. But it, you know, uh, nobody knows us today in the US. We're going in there. We're a completely unknown brand. So they don't really get excited about European companies in general. So it's a much tougher tougher sell in the US compared to UK, where we have a pretty good brand awareness, and we can be trying very different things. Um, sorry. Um, today, what is your well, biggest risk as a business, um, a new business that started operating? And, um, when the banks do start paying attention to you as a player in the market, what's to stop them from offering your rates? Greed. <laughs> so also, you know, I can uh, I can relate a little bit to my experiences back at Skype. So when we launched Skype, we didn't quite know what's going to happen. You know, what will the telcos do? Will they shut us down? Will they buy us and shut us down? Will they send their secret army to us? We had no idea what's, what's going to happen. Uh, what happened was quite interesting. So there's a, a quote from a very high up executive at AT&T saying, oh, consumers don't want to use this thing. The Skype will never work. That was about... Uh, nine years ago. So now Skype is a 10-year-old business and Skype owns 40% of international long-distance calling. Uh, and uh, none of the telcos lowers their prices uh, until they were feeling Skype very hard uh, on their bottom line. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, there's also a thing called Innovator's Dilemma, Clayton Christensen, which I'm sure has been quoted widely in this building. Uh, uh, that's been learned much more now, but so, somehow there is still not a much better response. And to be honest, if I was an incumbent, I wouldn't drop my prices either. It's not going to benefit me. So if I'm a leading UK bank with 20% market share, me dropping prices in my transfer, that's not going to make my life better. I'm just writing away hundreds of millions in, in profits. So that's going to be a, a long cycle where the banks have to get used to the new normal. But, but sadly enough for the banks, and I wouldn't really want to be a bank these days, so we're, we're taking money transfer. Same is happening in lending. The same is happening in asset management. Then there are these new, uh, new, new, uh, new banks coming, mobile only. Bloody hell! I don't know what to do if I was a bank. So and uh, and if uh, and, and already if we, so if we go forward, if we take away the uh, well, the pricing argument, the product we have is is inherently faster and better than a bank than than what banks can do, because all banks use a swift interbank network to do money transfer, which means it's slow. So recipient. Uh, bank also takes some money away from it uh, versus us having faster transfers plugging in locally in all of the countries. So I do think that our product is fundamentally better. It's much more competitively priced. Uh, and you know, I welcome the time when we have 10% market share and we'll fight with the banks uh, like equal to equal. Um, you mentioned the, the importance of speed and I think if you, if you transfer euros to pound it takes three to four working days, correct? Right? Approximately, do you think? Do you think anytime soon you get to say one or two working days, and how soon? So euros to pounds, I would guess uh, should take uh, less than one less than one business day, couple 
three, four, five hours usually now. Okay. So we're, uh, uh, we're so when we started, we were probably usually taking two days. Now it is usually taking less than one day, and we are moving towards uh, as fast as possible. Uh, so the problem here is we are mostly limited by things which are not under our control, which sucks because we can't do much about it, but we're limited by the banking network. So if you think about the Euro banking network, the SEPA network, SEPA network clearing cycles are, I think, five times a day now. So that's going to set one limit there. Uh, on pound side, it's better because faster payments is almost real time. <coughs> but so when we take money from someone's debit card on the Euro side and we send it to pounds, there's no reason why this shouldn't be happening within minutes in the not too distant future, so we're definitely moving towards that. Is there anyone as fast, or are you the fastest? Because I, I think, I mean, the regular banks take a couple of days for sure. Uh, I do think that we we should be pretty close to being the fastest. I can't, I can't imagine uh, who would do it. Uh, who would do it faster? I mean, you know, you can take, uh, you can always hop on a train from Paris to London, and that yeah. could be faster. There you go. Um, what's the biggest challenges that keep you awake at night and uh, are you currently looking for interesting disruptive opportunities to invest in and how would one be It's probably <laughs> my <laughs> uh, probably my 17 months old daughter keeps me up at night but otherwise she's lovely uh, I, uh, I I do look at interesting opportunities but uh, I really don't don't have time for that so I if you want if you want to pitch to me, find a way to get to me through my network, uh, have other investors who are already committed, and uh, I'll, I'll decide in 20 minutes. Uh. Are your biggest challenges at the moment that keep you awake up besides that? Besides that, um, it's about growing the team. So we're, we'll be more than 500 people by end of the year, so <laughs> finding these people, onboarding them to make sure they're efficient quickly, uh, managing the culture, you know, we're we're pretty. Uh, uh, we we keep our our company culture very very close to our heart, and we think think a lot about that. How do we how do we build a great company which can hopefully outlast us? You know, we're building a very very long term operation. If uh, if we were thinking about uh, about getting rid of this soon, I think we would do many things differently and many hiring decisions, etc. But I do think about every hire that. Uh, this person will be working with, working here with me five years from now, hopefully ten years from now. So how do we how do we choose people who can learn very fast, who will who will fit in our culture and and not start not start pulling it in any any weird directions? Sorry, yeah. Now you. Um, thank you. Partially answered that just now. What's the um, what's what's the realizing value timeline and or kind of theoretical plan? There's, there's IPOs, there's trade sales, there's three years' time, which your investors might force you into, there's ten. I have no idea. Because, to be honest, none of our investors have ever asked us this. And none of our investors can force us into, into anything like this. So what we've told them always is we're building a, a, lo a global, sustainable company, and that's the first goal. Uh, if we achieve that, then there might be other, other, other choices. But uh, there's so much, so much to do that uh, you know, why, why stop now? If I, you know, I would, I would be bored after two days. And uh, you know, why, why, do, why start over from, from the beginning when you have uh, an awesome company with, with so much more potential? So I, I do hope to, to be busy with this. Wants their money. If it's not it, that's why. But it's Say. Can't be forced. Yeah, we can, uh, and you know, so there are many, so there are many ways for someone who wants their money to get their money. So way, you know, the so way the uh, so world operates now is there is uh, plenty of uh, plenty of ways for people to to sell their stake or parts of their stake throughout the way. So you know, there is uh, there are very few benefits in general about uh, for going public nowadays. I think so. In that sense, uh, it's uh, it's about building building the company, and along the way there will be multiple opportunities. For people to get on or off the train. So I imagine you're asking yourself a question. 
question being, uh, how do you tackle slightly more challenging currencies, which are quite important, like the ruble or uh, Chinese RMB? So, how, how do you think you're going to tackle them? In a similar way, we've tackled the one so far, finding uh, finding partners. So, you know, in every country, we need to find the find a way to access a banking network. We need to find a way to to get extra liquidity if we don't have it. So. There's nothing fundamentally challenging, but you know, yeah, Russia and China are, are different for doing business. So you, know, you need to you need to keep that in mind as well. That you know, in general, there have been very few non-Chinese internet companies that have been successful in China so far. So you can think about what is the reason for that. What are the ways of getting around that? So in a sense, the answers are out there. Over there in the corner. Um, apart from providing you with the capital, how did your investors help you in building your company? Asking the, the right tough questions. So our our investors are in general uh, very trusting of, of me and Christo, and uh, that's been something that we also thought about when, when getting them getting them on board. So we raised our Series A from Peter Thiel's Valar Ventures. And uh, there's a little story about Peter Thiel, uh, which is about uh, Facebook. So uh, I think Peter was on the board of Facebook. He was an investor in Facebook. And Yahoo offered to buy Facebook for a billion dollars. And all the investors told to, told to Mark, uh, of course, Mark, you should go and sell it. But Mark was the guy who said, no, I'm not going to sell it. I'm not going to sell for a billion dollars, eh? and uh, and you know we all know what came of Facebook now, and who was who was right and who was who was wrong, and I think that uh, that's what a lot of investors nowadays are realizing that uh, the, the companies who create the most long-term value tend to be the ones who are who are being run by by their founders. Eh? So it's a question of finding <coughs> finding the right structures and ways uh, to do that. Uh, in the middle there. One of your competitors, uh, World Remit, is known to um, to transfer in 110 countries. So it seems that in terms of regulations, they're already um, a lot further. Um, how do you? It's it, it's related to the competitive question. How do you outpace them? Um, are you investing more in marketing um, than they do? Um, and is, are, are, are that the people that you that you tend to hire, or do you um, do you invest most of your energy in, in in your product? So, World Dreaming probably sends money to 110 countries. Yeah? I I don't think they even operate in the states yet. So, uh, I think you, know, you always get, get on a sense that source countries where you send money from and destination countries. I think they have a lot, lot more not lot more destination countries. Yeah? Uh, I'm, uh, but at the same time, I, I know how fast they are growing, and uh, and I know that we're growing our business faster, so I don't lose much uh, much sleep about that. So, if you say you you grow faster, um, is that in terms of total money that you are transferring, number of customers, number of customers, volume, and uh, number of transactions? And are you able to share how much you have to invest, like? Um, for every dollar you invest in marketing, what you can get out of it? It's uh, there is nothing, uh, nothing that I can share. Uh, you know, the, the important thing here is that uh, to help you think about it, uh, our customers tend to use us more than once. So what you are what you're playing with is a typical typical J curve. So you invest in customer acquisition and then you you go into into deep red deep red and then the question is how much uh, how much risk are you willing to take and how certain you are that your customers will will return to pay to pay it back. You know, we're I think we're, we're somewhere in the in the middle with our risk tolerance and and uh, and keeping on experimenting different different ways and thinking you know. What is uh, what is optimal optimal mixer? You are saying that um, you were focusing on product development to stay ahead of your competition. So, um, 
what do you see as the next product you would uh, launch? Um, we're in a very lucky position where we don't need to launch any any next product soon. It's just about keeping on keeping on improving the current product and bringing it into more countries. We're also, you know, we've put lots of uh, effort into uh, looking at the dynamics of word of mouth growth and what affects that. And uh, a couple of interesting things we've realized is that we we measure our NPS score. Uh, we have a very very high NPS score. But more important than that is that we realize that the people who, who give us a 10 as an as answer to NPS question invite three times as many people as the people who give us an 8 as the NPS answer. So making sure we keep on improving the product, increase our, our, our viral growth, that's the kind of product development that we put lots of time into. But other things I mentioned, uh, making sure we get our traffic to be faster, and uh, thinking about price, there's so there's so much more to do with the current product, and and staying focused on one thing I think is incredibly incredibly important. It would be way too easy for us to right now start thinking about doing a dozen different things and and forget mind transfer altogether. It would be it could be pretty catastrophic. So focusing on mind transfer, making sure we we get to the to the milestones of market share, and and then we see. I think we have time for just one more question, one or two. One more question. Okay. You're going to choose that, eh? um, <laughs> Under pressure, I can't, can't perform. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'd like to take you back all the way to your kitchen table where you started, started building this as an idea. Um, I, I've started a business in, in crowdfunding, and one of the big kind of hurdles is uh, regulation and obviously now you have the kind of weight and the uh, the investment and the money behind you to deal with that with all the all the requisite um, uh, consultants etc did you have so sort of, did you put a quite a lot of money into it to start with because that first transaction there's quite a big barrier in terms of the regulation and, and persuading banks to allow you to start transferring all these things can you give us some tips on how you get over those kind of hurdles? So, um, there are probably different ways of looking at regulation. Like in, in Skype, we, uh, we spent our time dodging regulation, making sure that uh, we don't become regu regulated as, as a telco because that would have pretty, pretty bad consequences. In transfer-wise, we started from the opposite view. We saw it's a little bit much better to work with the regulators and, uh, and that's also a way to ensure banks will be more happy to work with you and so on. So we got our first license, uh, we, we went through that with, with help from other people and it was uh, it, took, it took time and effort, uh, but it's, uh, it's doable. So then and you did that before you did your first 2,000 pounds? Yes. Cool, right. so that was the last question. So thank you, thank you very much and good luck to everyone.